You can be seated. Thank you, worship team. And isn't it good to come to the house of God? Amen. <laughs> Hebrews talks about not forsaking ourselves from the assembly because we need each other and we need to gather together and worship. And you never know what someone's going through. But God does, and God knows what they need. And He said He supplies all our needs according to His riches. Thank God for that, because some of us don't have enough riches to do that. Amen. But God's riches is plentiful, more than enough. I, um, as often I say, and often I tell you, there's times when a word drops in my spirit and and when it does, many times I don't even know what direction it's going to take, how it's going to develop, how it's going to play out. And so I just begin to search the scriptures and search the word and begin to just try to figure out and pray and just seek after what God is trying to say and try to make sense of it and try to deliver it and bring it. Because we need to be relevant. We need to have an on-time word because we serve an on-time God. And God always knows what we need. The word that dropped in my spirit this week was test. And I started just kind of reading, and I was really amazed when you type in the word test in the concordance and you find out how many times the word test is being used in the scriptures. And you realize that you have to take a test to have a testimony. And you realize that from the beginning, we were being tested as God's children. And we find out all the areas where he talks about testing and how he tests us and areas we're being tested in. And as I was thinking about that, and I know some of you will remember this and some won't be old enough to remember this, but there was... Harry Truman, in the 50s, came out with a, and I don't even know how you say it, it's spelled C-O-N-E-L-R-A-D, like Conalord. It was a system that was used to alert Americans if there was going to be a nuclear war that take place. And so they were trained. The kids were trained. Some of you remember maybe some of the training you had where you know, you had to hide underneath the desk and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, some of you laugh at that. You think that's silly, but that's what they did. And they had a system that came out, and when that alarm would go off, it would warn people, you know, because it was during the Cold War, and we never knew when Russia was going to bomb or whatever. All these things were taking place. But then in 63, they changed it, and they went to what we call the emergency broadcast system, which some of you know what I'm talking about because you've probably heard it before. You know, bang, the next 60 seconds, you know, this is a test. And every time it did that, it would always say, if this was the real thing, then you'd be prepared for it. And so, test is to prepare us for some what of emergencies. Test is to prepare us for really life. Yeah, Understanding that life is a test. Man, we talked about recently, I think Julie was talking on Father's Day, how, you know, some fathers wish they can do all over again, you know. Unfortunately, you can't. But... The same thing with life. Life is a test that we can't afford not to fail. Come on. We can't afford to fail. Amen? Life's a test that's, that's there, and we hope that we do it right the first time. We get it right the first time. How many times have you gone through relationships and you messed it up and you realize, man, I wish I'd have done something different? Come on. The same thing with life. We understand that we're in a test. And from the very beginning of time, when even when, when, when God was taking the Israelites out of Egypt... They were being tested. You find different places where he talked about that. But what I found really interesting was some of the places he talked about it, right before he ran through a test, some of the things that took place will blow your mind. Because, see, one of the places we find here in in Exodus, (coughs) we find a place where they're singing and rejoicing because they've just been through the Red Sea. Now, listen to me, folks. We're going somewhere. 
Here's a family, uh, here's a million people coming out of bondage. All of a sudden, Pharaoh is out on their tails. Pharaoh is fixing to capture them. And all of a sudden, you know, Moses stands up and he waves his, his staff and the Red Sea splits open and they cross to dry ground. Pharaoh's army comes in and they die. Now. now, I don't know about you, but if you've seen something like that, that should last for a while. Come on now. Amen? Come on now. You would think that, man, if you've seen something like that, that would be enough to carry you for some time. But we find here they're singing. Here in 1521, it says, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the riders, he was thrown into the sea. Now they're celebrating. Well, it wasn't very far along the line, they started whining and complaining again. Now, I know that don't sound familiar to some of us. None of us would do that. I mean, God is good to us, and we know that, so we don't complain about it. I'll be teaching a lie next week, Amen. amen. <laughs> but right after that, verse 24, it says, And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Here again, God shows up. So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And he cast it into the water, and the water was made sweet. There he made a statue of an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. Now here, we, here again, I mean, here they are. All of a sudden, they cry out, they need water. God shows up, throws a stick in the water, and the water turns sweet. Things are good. And he said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandment and keep all his statue, this is what happens. He said, then I will, well, he says, I will put none of the diseases of you on you, which I have brought out of the Egypt, Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now, he's making a promise here. He's saying, listen. If you heed to my voice, if you listen to what I got to say, if you pass the tests, these diseases that were coming out of Egypt, they won't, they won't bother you any. Okay? Let's keep going. Right after this, we jump over to 16, verse 1. And they journeyed from Elam on the... And all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. Now, it says they came to the wilderness of sin, which is between Rose Pine and Hornbeck. On the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. After, after they departed from the land of Lake Charles or, you know, the Ritter or wherever. Now, I said that because, listen, we have to relate to this. We have to understand, here's, they're coming out to the, the, what they call the, 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 he's saying here, he's saying the wilderness of sin. Can I tell you something? Some of us get in the wilderness of sin. Now, these guys are going into the wilderness of sin after they see in the Red Sea split, after the water comes, all these things are taking place. And you look at these things because you know the outcome, and you're easily to judge, be judgmental, and you say, well, if I'd have seen him split the Red Sea, I wouldn't have a problem that he wouldn't take care of us. Come on now. Yeah. That's what we would say. Come on now. We think that we, we're above that. Brother, we're not above that. Amen. He's going to test us. Yeah. Come on now. And here's the reality. You're going to either pass the test or you're going to fail. We need to pass the test. Let's keep going. <clears throat> he says, Then the whole congregation of the children was like complained against Moses. What? What? <laughs> complained again? Man, they, they're whining again. He says, And the children was like said to them, Oh, if you had just left us, we could have died in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and where we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They whine it again. Now let's jump up to verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quarter each day. That I may what? Test them, whether they're walking the law or not. Now he even said this. He said, Listen, on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Why did he do that? Because he didn't want them to gather on the seventh day. Okay? But see, he also wanted them to know that, hey, listen, I've got this thing under control. I want to test you to make sure that you do what's right. I'm going to give you the food that you need to eat, and don't worry about gathering enough because I'm going to give you enough on the sixth day that you have enough on the seventh day. But even at that, the Scripture says they, they, they cheated and they tried to gather more than they needed. And the Bible says that it, it, it just turned into maggots. Yes. Yeah. Come on now. It was hard. They couldn't eat it. Why? Because God said, don't do it. Right. Come on now. 
He says, I'm trying to t- show you something. I want to take care. You, we even find in the scripture where God's going, you don't need a king. I'll be your king. And they're crying out, going, we want a king. We want a king. And so he gives them Saul. Because Saul was good looking, tall, big, handsome. He looks like a king. We'll make him king. Instead of saying, listen, God, I, you're my king. Again, they're being tested. Let's keep going. Now, I want to point out some areas of test. We find in Deuteronomy, God's, he already knows our heart, but he wants to test our heart and he wants to humble our spirit. Do you realize when we're tested through humbling ourselves, revival takes place? Let me say that again. If you want to go find where revival is breaking loose in countries, find countries that, are, that have to humble themselves because things are going really bad. You find revival. Why? Because they realize, listen, we're going to humble ourselves or we're going to die. Can I tell you that prosperity could really destroy you sometimes? Man, I'm trying to breathe here. Prosperity could destroy you if you can't handle it. Now, again, I say it's okay to have things. Just don't let things have you. Deuteronomy 8 here, he says, Every command which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land in which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you out of this way for 40 years in the wilderness. Why did he do this? To humble you and test you. Now, sometimes when you're humble, you're just being tested, folks. Don't freak out. To know what was in your heart, whether you should... Keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you and allowed you to to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you known that man shall not live by bread alone but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth. What is he trying to say here? Listen. Listen. I'm going to give you the bread that you need for your body, but I want you to know something. You're not going to live by bread alone. You're going to live by every word that comes out of my mouth. Because what comes out of my mouth is more important than what you put in it. Hello, somebody. Because, see, when we understand that we're going to go through a test, and the only thing that's going to get us through the test is the answer. And the answer is simply this, Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Is he not? He's the answer to everything. Understanding that you're in a test right now, you must know that you're going to pass if you put Christ first. Amen. Let's keep going. He goes on to say, he says, you might live bread alone, but, by, but everything proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your garments did not wear out. That's good. Nor did your feet swell. Some of us could say amen to that. Amen. For 40 years, you shall know in your heart that as I chasten his sons, so the Lord God chased you. Why, why, why should we know this? Because he loves those that he chastens. If he didn't care about you, he wouldn't test you. Hello, somebody. If you don't care about your children, then you don't ever correct them. I have parents say, well, she's seven. She knows better. She knows what to do. Are you kidding me? You know what she's crying out? She's crying out, test me. Try me. Help me. See, God wants to help us through every test that we go along the way. Now, Here's what we understand. We must understand today simply this, that with the test, if we pass it, we live. We fail it, we die. Now, pastor, can you get any plainer than that? I don't think I can. Because if we do what's right and we pass the test, then we survive. If we don't pass the test and a nuclear bomb comes, hiding underneath the desk ain't going to save you. You got to pass the test. You got to know what to do, what's right. Amen? I remember even when we were in, in, in Bible college, and I remember we had a, a vehicle that was an older vehicle, and I remember my wife's praying this prayer. And I know some of you might think it's kind of silly, but she prayed. She said, God, I'll, I pray these tires will last us the whole time we go through school. Now, some of you think, well, that's a silly prayer. No, they would pray. God took care of them for 40 years. Their shoes didn't wear out, their, their feet didn't swell. You don't think God can keep a little thread on your tire? It's always a test. Now, he says here in Deuteronomy 19, 
or 30, 19, he says, I call heaven and earth as a witness. In other words, he wants you to know that everybody's watching this. I'm calling everybody as a witness. He says, today against you, that I have set before you what? Life and death, blessings and curses. Now, this is good. This is really good. Why is this good? Because not only is he giving us a test, but he gives us the answer. Come on now. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're taking a test and somebody gives you the answer, that's pretty good. How would you like to be taking a test and going, the answer is life. Hey, come on now. Choose life. Amen. Because some of us going, life, death, life, death. What to choose? What to choose? What to choose? He says, choose life. Now, here's the real deal. Choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that everything's going to happen to you because of something that your father did. But I'm telling you right now that you will affect things that your children will do. Because what one generation tolerates, the next generation practices. If you don't believe that, look around the room. Look around the earth. Look around the world. I told the men the other day, I, 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 I'm, just, I, I'm so broken over this. But you look at every sitcom on TV, belittles the father. And you wonder why kids are not listening to their parents. Because sitcoms are telling you, your daddy's an idiot. He don't know what he's talking about. And you know what you do? You buy into it. Hello, somebody. And you know what's really sad? Here's the sad part of that. Some fathers are buying into it if they're idiots. You need to wake up, men and women of God. You need to wake up and realize that you don't want, you, you need to help your kids pass the tests. Now, I know good and well when your kids bring projects home from school, you're going to help them. Hello, somebody. I know little Johnny, eight years old, didn't build no volcano. Hello. You know? We got to help them. And so even, even if, we, if we do what's right, we're going to help them live. Now, along the way, we find different tests. Gideon tests God, but guess what happened? God turned around and tests him. He said, listen, if you want me to do this, God, I'm going to lay this fleece. We're fleece layers. A lot of us are. If you never know that, heard that term, term before. We're going to lay this fleece, make it wet, everything else dry. He does that. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Make it dry, everything wet. He does that. Then later on, he says, listen, God says to Gideon, these people are still too many. Bring them more. I will test them for you. In other words, now I'm going to test you. He says, you think you need that many people? You don't need that many people. Why? Because these people are not the ones that are going to win the war. These people are not the ones. Listen, you went through the test. I told you to go. So if I'm telling you to go, test me on this. See if I won't kick their butts. Come on, somebody. Why? Because God is bigger than anything we face. You think that many times, you know what happens? We get so arrogant thinking it's us. (laughs) Look what I did. I'm all that. Hey, check it out. And all the time God's going, hey, I told you to do that, so I told you he's going to take care of you. We've got to come to a place where we trust. I remember when Kyle was little, he didn't like to fly. He hated to fly. He just, I mean, he didn't want to even get on a plane. He just, something about flying just freaked him out. Didn't like it. I didn't like it either for a long time. So I got my heart right. But anyway, <laughs> I remember Kyle was struggling with flying overseas. And I remember just saying something. He was a child. He was just a little boy. And I remember saying something. And all of a sudden, something clicked in him. And he looked at me. This is what he said. He said, Dad, he said, did God tell us to go to Russia? I said, yes, son, God directed Dad to go to school and go to Russia. And in his mind, this is what he said. He said, well, you know what? If God said that, then we're not going to crash. Now, let me tell you something. That out of the mouth of a babe brings revelation. Because he recognized that if God said it, then God's going to take care of it. You see, we got to come to a place when we're in a battle, if God said it, he can do it. Just a test. <laughs> Keep going here. We find even the world tests our wisdom. Does it not? Because, see, here, here, let me bring some revelation to you right here. The word wisdom means pounded in. Why, why are you saying there, Pastor? Well, you ever read Proverbs? Proverbs full of wisdom. You ever wonder why chapter 1 says something, four or five verses later, he says the same thing, just a different way? He's trying to get you to get it. As we learned as kids, we used to have these little, little cards, multiplication cards. Two times two, four. Five times five, 25. Guess what? The first time you saw it, you didn't get it. You had to see it and see it and see it and see it and see it. Finally, now when you look at it, you can write it off. The new generation, they just pull out their little iPad. Oh, it's 45. You know? 
But see, we have to understand, here, here's what we've got to understand. And please, I believe in higher education. You know, I went to school. I, there's many people who went to school in this room. I believe in higher education. But can I tell you something? You can go as high as you, you can have a PhD and not have wisdom. Because, see, wisdom only comes from the throne of grace. Wisdom only comes from God. There are people that don't have a fifth-grade education. My grandfather, who couldn't speak English, had more wisdom than most PhDs. Why are you saying that, Pastor? Because here we find that they came and they tested his wisdom. That's what it says. Whenever he found out about Solomon's wisdom concerning the Lord, she came to test him and ask him some hard questions. You know, I, I told a story about one time I was flying back from, from uh, Bogota, and I, and I landed in, in, in uh, uh, Florida, and the flights were difficult, and to make a long story short, it was the grace of God. I got on a flight, and this lady was sitting next to me, and her husband didn't even get the flight because I got his seat, praise the Lord, you know. <laughs> and on the way back, you know, here she is, and she's and her husband's PhD, and she's had her master's with her, and they're big into psychology and stuff. And, and all of a sudden, she started talking about her kids, and, and I could realize there were some problems with the kids. And I said, you know why you're having a problem with your kids? She says, why? And I said, because you don't spank them. And she was like, <laughs> <laughs> And all of a sudden, man, I said, let me tell you about kids. I started telling them some things that God showed me about kids. Brother, I'm telling you, she was over there going, write notes, man. <laughs> she wanted to know. Why? What I was saying to her was not something I had a PhD in. I had wisdom in. Because, see, wisdom only came from the throne of grace. And these things that happened, that she's just going, wow, wow, wow. Matter of fact, she told me she was an atheist. She said, we, we, we're atheists. We don't believe. We don't believe. We don't believe. I said, really? I said, do you have a Bible? She says, yeah, I think I do. I said, well, let me tell you what to do. I said, you're a smart lady. You owe it to yourself to do this. I said, take that Bible and begin to read it. But here's the challenge. If you read that Bible and it don't speak to you, throw it away. Bro, that stirred her up. Why? Because, see, wisdom is alive. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. What's the principal thing? Jesus is the principal thing. Understanding that wisdom comes directly from God, and you will be tested. You'll be tested every time somebody tells you about church. They'll say, you go to church on Sundays? Don't you know the ball game's coming on? Don't you go fishing? Don't you do this? Don't you do this? Don't you do this? You do what? Tithe? Are you kidding me? Why? They don't get it because they don't have wisdom. And guess what? You can't explain it to them. Because if you do, you get all frustrated. Amen? Amen? See, God will test the heart here. Second Chronicles 32, 31, God withdrew from them in order to test him that he might know all that was in their heart. See, out of the, out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Hello? Out of the abundance. Amen? Let's keep going here. Jeremiah 17, 9 said this, the heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? Verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his way, according to the fruit of his doing. In other words, listen, God will test you in what you're doing. Hello? The Bible says be a doer, not a, not a hearer only. Are you deceiving yourself? You can talk about it all day long, but until you put the rubber to the road, you ain't doing nothing. Here's a good thing here. I love this part here. The Lord tests the righteous. He says in Psalms 11, 4, the Lord is the holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyes test the sons of man. The Lord tests the righteous. I like that. But the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked, he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and a burning, burning wind. So shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves the righteousness. His countenance beholds of the upright. Jeremiah talks about it. 2012. But, O Lord of hosts... You who test what? The righteous? And see the mind of the heart. Let me see your vengeance on them, for I have pleaded my case before you. Now, here's how God tests us many times. God tests us with fire. Hello. That's what it says here. Let's look in, in 13.9. It says, I will bring the one-third through the fire. We will refine them as a silver, as silver is refined, and test him as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer, refine and test them as God has said. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, these are my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. You see, we will be, we will be put through the fire. 
you will be tested in the fire. How you come out to the other side, and listen, here's, here's the great thing about fire. Fire is, is a purification. Because many times we go through fire. Fire will purify those zincs and those things that we shouldn't have in our lives. It will burn off all the junk. Because if it's not of God, it will die. God always tests us with fire. Some of you are going through the fire today. <laughs> Amen? 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. In other words, listen, you can build a house with sticks and wood and straw and everything else, but you strike a fire to it, it's coming down. Amen? And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he was built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned... He will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet, so is through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now, see, this is a revelation that some of us really need to get a hold to. Because if you're a born-again believer, guess what? God dwells inside of you. Somebody says, well, you shouldn't eat too much. I'm just making more room for God to live. Amen? Why live in a studio apartment when they can have a four-bedroom house? Come on, somebody. <laughs> Look, we'll find every reason for sin. Come on, somebody, man. We'll justify it. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Then he says, which temple are you? That's a good question. It's a test. What temple are you? <laughs> Second Corinthians talks about it here again. It says in 2 2, eight. it says, Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For this end I also wrote that I might put you to what? To the test. Whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive. Listen, he's talking about forgiveness here. Did he not test the guy when he says, Listen, I'm going to forgive you of all your debts. And all of a sudden the guy ran to the guy, owed him a little bit of money, and he threw him in prison. What did he say? He said, I'm going to throw you to the tormentors. See, God tests us to even forgiveness. He says, if I forgive you, you should forgive the people around you. If you tell me that you can't forgive somebody, I'm going to tell you you're in trouble. Pastor, you don't know what they did. You don't know what I went through. You can sing that song all day long. You can tell it to somebody else. Because, see, you've got to learn to forgive. And he wants to test us in this. That's what he says. He tests us in these things. And here's what happens. He goes on to say, I have forgiven that one for your sake in the presence of Christ. Now, this is what he says here in verse 11. Least Satan should take advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, I mean this. Listen, if you don't learn to forgive and walk in forgiveness, you're going to fall right into the enemy's device. You don't think I've seen that? Oh, my Lord, I've seen it too many times, more than I want to, want to talk about. I've seen people who, who had a hard time forgiving sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so or whatever so-and-so, and they get all mad, you know, and, and then all of a sudden they allow that, that bitterness to set in their lives. And you know what happens? That is the device of the enemy. And the enemy comes in, and all of a sudden he says, man, that church is a bunch of hypocrites. I wouldn't go back. And next thing you know, you're not even in church at all. Next thing you know, you're raising your kids, and, and, and you wonder what happened. What happened was you allow the enemy's device to come in and destroy your life. And so here's again a, the saying I, I said in the very beginning. We the past this thing, are we going to fail? He tests us as in forgiveness. He forgives us, we should forgive others. Here's another thing. He tests us in all things that's good here. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, he said, Now we exalt you, brother. Warn those who are unruly. Comfort the, the faint-hearted. Uphold the wick. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. But always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all, for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecy. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Abstain from it. Then he goes on to say that the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. He who calls you is faithful will do it. Now, why are you saying these things? Because 
God's going to test us in all things that are good. He wants to know that. He says, what did he say? He tests all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from even the, the form of Listen, we have to know that we cannot pet sin like it's a lap dog and wonder why it bites us. Yeah. Folks, we're, we're, we, listen, here's, here's what I'm trying to do today. You ever, you ever took those crash courses? When I was in real estate, I remember taking crash courts tell you, really, the, the course was not to teach you real estate. It was to teach you how to pass the real estate test. Y'all you already took tests like that? Some of you teachers, you know, got to take these tests. I know Julia had to go take these tests, and, and some of the classes she took was to prepare her how to take the test. Can I tell you something today? I'm trying to give you a crash course how to take the test. We got to understand that we're going to walk through a test, and only we're going to pass this test is we know how to pass the test. Amen. We need to know that we will be tested. If you come here today and you say, Pastor, I'm a Christian, I'll never be tested, you're deceiving yourself. Amen. And somebody's already lied to you. Come on now. Come on now. This is what we need to do right here, and this is what I want to try to highlight and, and complete in the next few minutes. We must pass this test or die. It's what I said earlier. Now, today we must pass the test. How do we pass the test? This is where how to pass. I want to teach you how to pass the test. Ready? We pass the test when we learn to overcome temptation. Now, Pastor, that's, that's, that's really easy. Is it really? Is it really? Because if it was really easy, then we would all overcome it. Well, let me, let me free you up. You ready for this one? Temptation is not sin. Temptation is not sin. It's yielding to it. Because, see, you can recognize temptation. Temptation by itself is not sin. That should be a rap song. Amen? <laughs> You know? It's not. It's yielding to it that causes the sin. Amen. See, you can pass by my house and I've got a mailbox out front. You can recognize it to be a mailbox. That's a mailbox. And that's cool. You know it's a mailbox. The problem comes when you start digging in my mailbox. Hello? You can see it. You know what it is. Don't stop and lower the flag. <laughs> <laughs> you got to see these things. We have to overcome temptation. Because, see, I'll tell you what, let me free you up on this one. Ready for this one? Jesus even said this. He cried out to him. He says, Wake up. Basically, he says, Wake up. Why are you sleep? Rise and pray. At least you enter into temptation. You know, I, I wrote down here, Wake up. We need to wake up. We need to wake up and realize that temptation is temptation, and temptation will kill you. Avoid every appearance of evil. Run from temptation. If you know you have a problem with alcohol, don't go hang out at Billy Goat Hill. If you've got a problem in a certain area of your life, don't go where you're going to be tempted and fall into it. I remember one time my dad brought us to my cousin's house, and they lived out by this canal, and we were younger, and they told us, don't go near the water, don't go near the water, don't go near the water. Well, they were swimming, and, and I was fully dressed, and we were going somewhere else, and and they had a mudslide. I know some of you don't know what all that is. Y'all got regular slides. We didn't, I didn't swim in a, a, a pool. We had rivers and creeks and ponds and stuff like that. And so we'd make our own slides. And they had a mudslide. And they threw that mud up. And I was, just, I was just a boy. And I'm looking at thing. And I'm just so tempted. You know, and I'm just thinking, man, I, you know, daddy told me not to get wet. And I went and stood by the mudslide. Well, guess what? I slipped in. I failed that test. And my daddy let me know it when I was walking home and he saw it. Do you know what a helicopter sounds like? You know what I'm talking about, you. No, you, you I call it, I told my boys it's a helicopter. You ever have a helicopter? My dad would take his belt off and he would pull it through those loops and you'd hear it. Do, 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 do. You knew the helicopter was coming. <laughs> I failed the test. Now you get the consequences. Do, 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 do. Yeah. We all have temptations. But 2 Corinthians says this, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. <gasps> you kidding? Can we just remove that? Because he's, what he's saying there is you think you all that in a bag of chips, you're going to trip. He says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as coming to man. But God is faithful. Who? will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able. But with every temptation, will also make you a way of escape. 
that you'll be able to bear it. Listen, this is the greatest scripture you can write about temptation. Write this on the wall. Write this on your car. Write this on your, your, your laptop. Write it down. Because what he says here, it doesn't matter what temptation you fall into, he's going to give you a way out of it. Oh, man. Come on now. See, we got to see that. Because see, many times we fall into temptation, we go, oh, I'm just, there's no way out. It's like being on a diet and you slip up and you go, oh, I fell. You bring on the ice cream. Bring on the cake. We fall right into it. But see, with every temptation that we face, God says he promises a way out. If you've been tempted in an area of your life, if you're in a room and, 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 and you're, you're being tempted with lust with somebody you shouldn't, whatever the case may be, can I tell you something? Run. And if there's not a door there, jump through the window. <laughs> Come on. Because see, that little small temptation that you think is going to be so satisfying, I've seen lives totally destroyed, built 50 years, destroyed in 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I'm telling you right now, you need to look for that escape because God is going to give it to you if you're looking for it. He'll give it to you. Always give us a way out. James talks about it also. We read about James. And we talk about how he says, you know, count it a joy when you go through trials and temptations. He says in verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Listen, he says, if you pass these things, you got the crown of life. What is he trying to say there? Choose life. Get life. Here's life. Don't fall in temptation. I got something better for you. It's called life. Here's the next thing. Go on quickly. We're talking about how we pass these things, how we pass the test. We pass the test when we overcome temptation. We pass the test when we, when we learn to examine ourselves. It's quiet. I'm not talking about examining yourself against somebody else. I'm talking about examining yourself. Because, see, you can look at somebody else and go, well, I'm not that bad. Look what they're doing. I can't be that bad. That's a, that's, a, that's a trap from the enemy right there. You need to learn to examine yourselves, the Scripture talks about. Look within yourselves. Let's see what it says. It says, 2 Corinthians 13, 3, Since we speak, I mean, since we seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak towards you, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives. How? By the power of God. But we also walk in him. See, if you try to do it by the power of self, Come on you know these self books, self, self, me, me, me? Well, that's, a, that's a new age bunch of stuff. Read the blanks. For also, it says, it goes, for we also are weak in him, but we shall live when, with him by the power of God towards you. And he says in verse 5, examine yourself as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you're disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we're not disqualified. Test yourselves. I, I, I said this before, and, and I love it because it was one of those moments that I was flying to some missions in Costa Rica, and I'm on a plane, and, and I'm reading some of Maxwell's book, John Maxwell, and, and I probably read that book several times, but I'm reading it on a plane, and, and one statement he says, and I've shared it with you before, but it's so, it was so revelational for me. He said... He said this, he says, we judge people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. And boy, I tell you what, that just woke me up because I realized many times people get mad at me and I'm thinking, well, I had good intentions. Hello? But I tell you what I had to do. I had to learn to start judging myself by really what, what my actions was. Because my intentions, the Bible, not the Bible, but people say, you know, the, the, what's the road of good intentions or whatever the term is? When we learn to just quit judging, look, we judge everybody by their actions, but we judge our own selves by our intentions. We need to judge ourselves, examine ourselves by what we do, not what we say. Amen? 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 See, that was revelational for me because there was times in people's life where people say, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. Yes, Pastor, I believe that, I believe that. And they weren't doing anything they said they believe. And I thought to myself, God, what is wrong with that picture? And I'm telling you, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, look, people only do what they believe. Come on. You can tell me all day long, I believe this will happen if I do this, but unless you do that, you don't really believe it. 
You can tell me all day long. I believe in tithing. And you don't tithe? You don't really believe it. Tell me all day long, I believe in healing. But if you don't pray for the sick, you don't believe it. I'm just telling you, I'm trying to get you to examine yourself. I'm trying to get you to understand that these are things that we have to look within ourselves if we're going to pass this test we call life. Here's the next thing. We can only pass godly tests when we try and know the right spirit. Let me just read this to you, and then I'll go somewhere with it. First John 4, 1 John 4.1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. That's what it says. But test the spirits, whether they're of God, because many false prophets have gone out to the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. Well, Pastor, I'm waiting for the Antichrist. I only have a tattoo, 666. Listen, the Bible says this. Anything Antichrist is Antichrist. He says, the spirit of the Antichrist, which have you heard of, was coming. He says, it's now already in the world. Yeah. Can I tell you something? We have Antichrist government in some places. Yeah. We have Antichrist when you see him going against what God said is what's the right way to do, and they anti. It's happening. And here's the reality of that. We're buying into it. And, and the sad thing about it is society is saying, it's Okay. And here's, here's one of the real truth. Let me look over here and i say this one. Here's the sad reality. You wouldn't believe how many people in the church today don't know the difference. They don't know what the difference with Antichrist and anti-God. It's got to be okay. The government says it's okay. Just because the government says it's okay don't mean it's okay. What does God say about it? See, listen, we're living in a day and an hour. We've got to pass this test. We're being tested right now. Fathers, wake up and, and take the test for your children. Don't sit idly by and go, well, little Susie, little Johnny, they're 12. They know what to do. Are you kidding me? Little Johnny, little Susie don't know what to do at 12 years old. Oh, they can make up their own mind. You know, I tell them if, if they're going to have sex, they need to, to just have protection. Are you kidding me? See, society is buying into this garbage. I heard recently an interview with some celebrities talking about they never corrected their kids. One day going to wonder why their kids are drug, sex, and rock and roll. You know? I, I'm trying to get you to see something, folks. I'm trying to get you to understand. Pastor's not mad at you. I love you. I love you. I love you. If I didn't love you, then I wouldn't care. I'm telling you today that we got to wake up and realize that we're in a test. And we're going to have to pass this test. If we don't pass this test, we die. Simple as that. Simple as that. You are little children. Have overcome them because... He who is in you is greater than he's in the world. That alone is enough right there. Amen? Amen. They're of the world. Why? Because they speak of the world, and, and they, the world hears them. We are of God. Who, he who knows God hears us. He is not of God, does not hear, but this, by this we know that the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Can, can I tell you something, folks? Listen to me when I'm saying this. And, and I'm going to talk to the, to the adults just for a second. You need to know what God's saying for your children. You need, you need, you, when's the last time you asked God to give the right mate for your kids? When's the last time you asked God for directions for your children? When's the last time you prayed, you know, God, give me wisdom to speak to my children? For grandparents, too. We need to know that God is wanting to give us how. He said it through his power. You see, we have to get this. The same spirit, the Bible says, that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in us. The Bible gives us what we call the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. That job of the Holy Spirit is to direct and guide us and lead us into all truth. If we allow it, When's the last time you allow the Spirit of God and you say, when's the last time you prayed this? God, it's not what I want, it's what you want. God, it's, it's what do you want me to do? God, show me what you want me to do. God, show me what you want me to give. God, show me what you want me to do. God, show me where you want me to go. God, show. When's the last time we did that? Folks, I'm, I'm trying to get you to see something today. I know that, that for some of you, you think, man, he is so radical. I am, because I take my job serious. I take what I do as a pastor 
you won't meet another pastor that's as serious as I am about what I do. Pastor, there's a lot of good pastors out there. There's a lot of good pastors. I'm just telling you that I take what I do serious. Why? Because I know that if I do the wrong thing, that, that, that blood will be on my hand. And all I know is one day when I face my, my God, I want him to look at me and say, man, Bobby Joe, hmm. well done, my servant. Come on in. Well done, my servant. For some of us, all we're going to hear is, well, you're done. I, I want to know that I've done what's right. You know, it's not, it's not what I want. I, I want what God wants for me. Pastor, you make mistakes every day. Every day. But every day I cry out. Every day I cry out and say, God, what, what do you want me to do today? God, what, what, are, you, what are you trying to show me today? I've been crying out for souls. You know, there are people that God has put me in their life, and I, I've been crying out for their souls. And, 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 and I believe that it's the will of God for them to be saved. And, and, I, and, and I don't want to miss it. I don't want to get too busy. I don't want to get to the point where I miss a soul. What if you gain the whole world and lose a soul? Here's the last thing is this. Here's the greatest test. The test of knowing him. Knowing him. 1 John 3. 1 John 2, 3 says this. He says, now by this we know that we know him. How do we know him? If we keep his commandments. Who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Whatever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Throughout scripture, throughout biblical history, there are men and women that went through tests. Shadrach, Meshach, they went through fire. The Bible says they, they looked in there and said, well, there's another one in there. Who's that? It's God walking with them. Do you think that Daniel just woke up one day and just said, yeah, throw me in the lion's den, I'm cool? He went through a test. He, long, long before he ever got thrown in the, in the lion's den, he walked through some tests. I will tell you, long before I came here to pastor this church and walk away from a very nice home in the Gordon District and move in a trailer that needed a lot of repair, long before I ever did that, I had went through other tests. Because, see, for me, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you, for me, it didn't even bother me. Because all I could see is what I was doing for Christ, what I was doing for the kingdom of God. See, when God can trust you in an area that he tests you in, he's going to give you a bigger test. And he's going to give you more to be tested for and tested with. We think that we want the big test first. We'll never pass the big test. We've got to pass the little test before you ever get to the big test. If God can't trust you with the little things, how in the world can he trust you with the big things? We fool ourselves when we think that, that I can do the big test. That's like the kids, that, you, you know, if I would have been walking across the Red Sea, then I wouldn't have a problem with believing that God wasn't going to supply our needs. They didn't do it. Well, these people were just like you and I. No different. And here's the last thing here is this. I'll tell you something not to test. You better not test the Holy Ghost. There was a guy by the name of Ananias who sold some land. Can I tell you something? He didn't have to give all what he had. He didn't have to. It was his. He could have done what, obviously he could have done what he wanted to do with it. But for whatever reason, he lied to the Holy Ghost and said, I gave it all. Now, I don't know about you, but <laughs> don't lie to the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that he dropped dead. They carried him out of there. His wife came in with the same lie a couple hours later. They said, the same men that carried your husband, now here come their feet. They're coming to get you too. Carried her out too. Why would you say that, Pastor? Because I'm telling you, man, God is a God of love. And he loves each and every one in this room. But I'm going to tell you also, God is a God of wrath. Come on now. 
God will, will, listen, don't mess with God. Don't play with God. God is not taken for play. He's God. He's God. And here's the reality of that. He can do whatever he wants. And not you or no one else can stop him. Even when they were trying to, to, to rile up this riot and all this stuff, and he stood up and he said, listen, if it's of God, if it's a man, it'll die. If it's of God, you ain't going to stop it. If you're being tested and God is in it, God will get you through it to the other side. Amen. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. There are people today are being tested. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I can sit here and generically name of all kind of tests that you're going through. And I know if I said some, some of you would say, oh my Lord, he must have bugged my house. But I'm telling you by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. And there's men in this room that know what to do and being tested what to do for whatever reason they're saying, I can't do this. I I, I, that's, I, I can't do that. No, I can't do that. I can't do that. Here's a lie. Here's a lie. Satan will lie to you and say these things to you because if there's something to do with the, the God's promise, then the Satan will twist it. He'll tell you every reason why you can't. But I'm telling you, God says you can. Nothing is impossible for God. There's women in this room right now being tested in areas. And God is saying, just trust me. There are young men and women, young teenagers being tested. God's saying, trust me. Believe in me. I'll get you through it to the other side. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around, just for a moment. Let's be honest before God. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you. But I do want to pray for you, and I want you to be honest with God with this. Maybe you're here this morning, and you say, Pastor... I'm going through a test. I'm being tested. I don't need to know what it is. That's between you and God. All I want to do is pray for you. All I want to do is pray for you. You're here today and you're being tested. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just throw your hand up and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Don't miss an opportunity. I want to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Thank you, Father. God, you know the hearts of your people greater than anyone else. God, you know the test that's bearing down on them. And God, whatever it is, God, you said you'd never give us more than we can handle. And God, your word is very clear in a lot of areas of our life. So God, as these men and these women, these young teenagers walk through these tests, God, give them wisdom to pass it. Let them know that greater is the God that dwells inside of them than the one of the world. Greater is the God that's going to give them all the answers in a way of escape in every test. God, thank you for that. God, I thank you that you're meeting the needs of your people. God, I thank you that we're going to have victory in all these areas we're being tested in. God, these men and these women is going to pass the test that's set before them. God, they're going to begin to see how great thou art. How great thou art. How great you are, O oh God. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just for a moment. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, the Holy Spirit is drawing my heart. I've never accepted Jesus as my Savior. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, I, there was a time I was serving the Lord, but I'm just backslid. And I want to get that right right there with you, between you and God from the heart, because he knows your heart. Just pray, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. From the heart, Jesus, come and live in my life. Jesus, you're mine, I'm yours. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, save me, forgive me. Maybe you prayed that for the first time, or maybe it's a prayer of your dedication. Again, I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you. just want to pray for you. If you prayed that prayer this morning, right where you at, just throw your hand up and put it back down. Thank you, 
Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. God, hands all over. God, you're speaking to your people with a clear voice. God, I understand that sometimes when we go through tests, fear. Some people have fear of tests, test, test anxiety. God, you can bring us peace in all those areas that we are frightened and fearful. God, I lift up all the hands that said they want to either rededicate their life or give their heart to you. God, I pray for men and women in this room if 